welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. I'm here today with Simon, I'm going to butcher this probably, Shilabiks. Simon is the founder and chief strategy officer of Handprint, a platform designed to help companies manage their corporate social responsibility and, and environmental, social, and governance efforts. They do this by connecting companies to fantastic causes that they curate with the help of a global impact board. They digitize these causes, and once they establish a direct impact connection with an interested company, they automate, integrate, report, and visualize the positive impact that their actions have. So I came across you in an email sweep. I was working with a company that was helping me to find potential uh, interesting companies to interview because my efforts through Help a Reporter uh, while I do get some really interesting people, are not always enough. Um, and so I got access to you. You're based in Singapore. My company's in Singapore. Uh, so there's some interesting similarities there. And one thing that we talked about when uh, we had our first call off on the air was the fact that being uh, Westerners in Asia and having a team that is a little bit more globally focused, sometimes we hit upon an issue where uh, curiosity um, may get in the way of hiring or lack of curiosity may get in the way of having a diverse team. And so we thought that would be a really interesting conversation, especially as we're heading into 2023. This episode is being recorded several days before 2023 and will be published uh, several weeks into 2023. And so uh, I thought it would be interesting for us to discuss really uh, the uh, pros and cons of uh, diversity versus curiosity and what teams should be thinking about uh, into 2023 and in, in their hiring. So uh, thank you for taking the time to talk with me, Simon. I appreciate it. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about yourself and how you got over to Singapore and starting this company? We'll go from there. Hey, Sean, thanks so much for having me. So yeah, as you already said, uh, you, you gave a beautiful description of what Handprint is all about. So we... Uh, to get, so me and my two co-founders, Matthias and Ryan, uh, co-founded Handprint at the end of 2019 here in Singapore, just before the circuit breaker started messing with our lives because of COVID. Before I started this company, I was a 100% academic um, professor in a business school here in Singapore called Singapore Management University. And my research interests were already for the last seven, eight years, really on the intersection of digitization and sustainability, specifically environmental sustainability. And as part of that research, I also founded back in 2018, a nonprofit organization called Global Mangrove Trust that is also doing work on using digital technologies to improve access to international climate finance. But at some point, um, my co-founder Ryan and I realized um, under the impetus of our current CEO, Matthias, that scaling a nonprofit organization was not the most suitable organizational type and that we should set up a new enterprise, which became Handprint. And so that's about three years ago now on the dot. And um, we've grown to about 40 people in 12 countries, mainly in Southeast Asia, East Asia, but also we have people in the US and in Europe. So it's a pretty global team trying to work with companies all over the world to create a positive impact in the world and make it valuable for companies to do that. The company is called Handprint, but we all we often talk about footprints, right? If you're going hiking somewhere or if you're creating carbon through whatever activities, we, we use the word footprint. Why did you choose Handprint? Footprint is the sum of all the negative impact you or company has on the world and so it's a very commonly used term in in business in sustainability and also of course of course we talk about footprints on the moon and so it's like leaving an imprint but the the flip side of footprint is handprint there is a it's a scientific term that is not so popular but it basically captures all the positive impact you're creating in the world and there's an entire scientific methodology that mainly was designed by people at mit that tries to help organizations figure out what is your positive impact in the world. And while business over the last 30, 40 years has done quite a lot of work in trying to optimize the measurement of their negative impact, this has often come at the expense of 
measurement for the sake of measurement. And so what Handprint tried to do is really provide a counterfactual, an alternative perspective, an alternative approach to how companies should think about their environmental responsibility. And our overarching thesis is that the environmental responsibility of an organization should not be limited to simply reducing its negative impact. There is a much more aspirational goal to be found in working with companies to create a positive impact in the world. That appeals more to employees, it appeals more to customers, and it has a much better alignment actually with the capitalist system, where the goal of profit-seeking organizations is to maximize profit, and that aligns much more with creating a very sizable or maximize a handprint rather than having a goal that is just about limits and constraints, which is the footprint. I like that a lot, actually. I, I agree. I think a lot of people are focused on the negatives of how do I prevent this thing or that thing. But, but when you flip it around like that, yeah, you can think about, oh, there's so much potential that I can do, so much good that I can do. And uh, so... I, I think I had mentioned to you, I had a friend in China that is doing a CSR company and they, they take money from the company. Basically they're given a budget and then they spend it for the company basically as they see fit. And they do this in, in a way that makes the company look good. And also, you know, they, they take like 10% of, uh, the budget, like as their fee. So they say, oh, you want to spend 30 million this year? All right, well, it's it's going to cost us 3 million to make that happen, probably. Like, that's ours. Um, how does your platform actually work in that regard? I mean, I, I know in my description, in the intro, I, I talked about how you guys do it, but um, how does the finances of it all work? The example of your friend in, in China is pretty interesting. So the way that Handprint works is... At its essence, what we do is we work with companies to enable them to link their strategic KPIs, KPIs that have nothing to do with sustainability. But we try to link those KPIs, the achievement of those KPIs, and they could be at a very high strategic level, they could be at a much more tactical level or even at a product level. So, But once we have a KPI that a company identifies as this is something that we really want to accomplish, if you then create some simple automation by, by using digital tools, APIs and whatever, um, and you link that automation to something good in the world, then achieving your strategic APIs has the positive externality of creating a positive impact in the world as well. And so this is by and large how our system works. So we have built tools that enable companies to integrate uh, online and offline sales with the creation of a positive impact or integrate the creation of attention in the form of advertising eyeballs to link that to positive impact or the volume of transactions or the number of unique website visitors or the number of times that you move in like a prospect in a CRM system from prospect to lead or from lead to client. So any kind of action that has a digital fingerprint can be turned into a handprint. Now, on the financial side, how does that work for us? So we work as commercial agents for nonprofit organizations that we bring into our ecosystem. That means that we are responsible for selling their impact products. And so we kind of move away from fundraising. We work with NGOs to turn them uh, to kind of help them evolve from a donation paradigm where they receive money and then do something towards an impact productization paradigm where they define a discrete unit of impact, such as one tree planted and monitored for a period of time or uh, one hour of education provided or one meal provided or a thousand liters of drinkable water provided via a filter. So we create this discrete unit of impact, we price that together with the NGO and then uh, that becomes purchasable on our platform. So as part of that is a part is a commission that the NGO uh, pays us, but the largest part of our revenue as our business model is evolving is coming from subscriptions. So we are trying to develop the platform like a SaaS. 
so that a company depending on its size and depending on the level of verification of impact that it requires will pay a monthly fee and then most if not all of the money hopefully at some point in the future all of the money that the company sends to us will be transferred to the impact partners all over the world it's an interesting model for sure i i love SaaS because you know you keep companies paying you month after month after month and a good number of them actually forget that they're paying and so you get to continue collecting revenue despite the service not actually being used although in your situation you probably want them to use your service as much as possible because you're hoping that you know they'll have these positive outcomes where they can help people and and it, yeah very very different from i guess the way chinese companies think about it which mostly is like we've got a ton of cash let's throw it around and and make ourselves look good and there's no KPIs behind it. The big difference between how many organizations do CSR or kind of non-strategic philanthropic giving and what Handprint does is that we really focused on how do we turn the creation of public value, right? Which is really everything that aligns with what we call social and environmental regeneration. So any kind of imaginable activity that creates this positive impact. So doing so from a company's perspective, is a hard sell, right? Why would a company do this? Except like in countries like India, you have a regulatory obligation to do some kind of philanthropic giving from the moment that you become profitable. Um, in the US, it's very common that there's a lot of corporate philanthropy, mainly because there's very low tax rates or a lot of ways of using philanthropy to avoid paying tax. In Europe, it's much less common to do this kind of strategic philanthropy because of the high taxation and the fact that the welfare state really takes care of most of the things that in the US many companies kind of take care of like education and so. So, but when we look at this kind of approach, then companies very often end up doing things that are either totally non-strategic, either very much driven by, oh, we need to do this to maintain our organizational legitimacy within our country form of national service, as it's commonly called in Singapore. Uh, or they do this as a consequence of kind of pet projects of executives, right? So a CEO or another person in power in the organization that has some kind of discretionary budget and wants to support something privately, but uses their corporation to do this. Right? And so if you're doing these kind of things, then it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to appropriate significant value from that kind of philanthropic giving. So, and as a consequence, doing that is not very resistant to changes in the environment, negative environmental effects, shocks and all of those kind of things that we've experienced since COVID. So it becomes much more interesting if you look at your that budget that you have to do good um, as an engine of growth. And so this is really what Handprint is trying to do is by telling companies like, look, because customers and because employees and increasingly also suppliers and, and buyers and so, because more and more actors in the world are interested in this kind of positive impact. If you can connect it to your organizational goals, your wider organizational goals, and you embed it in your interactions with your key stakeholders, it becomes a very interesting story that you have to tell every single person or every single company that you engage with, right? So every time that you make a sale, you tell your customer, by the way, buying this product I don't know, removes a kilo of plastic from the ocean. Or every time you use your mobile phone to make a payment, you show your customer, okay, 1% of this payment is actually going to be rerouted to support a project that you choose. And so there's a lot of ways in which embedding impact in transactions or in interactions really changes the way the relationship that you're building with a customer or a stakeholder or an employee evolves over time. And this is where the big value is coming from. Let's say I wanted to go to Nike's website and buy a pair of, of shoes, for example, which I Nike isn't supporting us and I don't buy some Nike. So this is just an example. Uh, are you saying at checkout, I can say, oh, I would like to add 1% 
on top or I would like you to take 1% of my payment and put it towards X, Y, or Z? Like, how does that work? Because like, at least in America, I don't know about other countries. I haven't really seen them. There'll be like Save the Children Foundation or the UNICEF and these other kinds of things. And and when you get to check out, they'll go, oh, would you like to add a dollar for this thing? My answer is always no, because I don't know where the hell it's going. And why should I have to pay for it? The company should pay for it. <laughs> so you're pinpointing the two critical barriers to success in the impact space for from a corporate perspective. One is who's paying for it. Right? The reality is it should be the company that at least ostensibly makes the contribution. Right? So if you're asking a customer like, hey, do you want to pay $5 extra? The customer doesn't have a very interesting experience because if they want to do this, they might as well do private donations. Right? They can just give to an NGO directly. So that's not very interesting. Secondly, if you're doing it in a way that doesn't give the customer end-to-end -end transparency on what is happening, then you're really asking them, please have faith in me. I'm going to do something good with this money that you throw in a black box and trust us, something good is going to happen. And that's also not a very appealing value proposition because more often than not, customers are quite skeptical and rightly so because they've been deceived many a time by companies making a variety of false claims or at least claims that are not entirely true. So the way this would work from our perspective at Handprint is that one, we encourage all our customers, our corporate clients, that they should embed impact in the price. Does that mean that they are not going to increase the price? Well, that is something that's hard to figure out in advance. But the recommendation is it should be embedded in the price. It should not move. Um, it should not force the customer to make an additional payment because this is unlikely to work. And actually, it's more likely to backfire. It might create negative impact. And secondly, um, the closing of the loop is very important so that if the customer sees that, okay, a tree is going to be planted or $5 is going to go to UNICEF or save the children if, I, if I'm buying this product, you need to get information about when that money is going there, what is happening with that money, uh, what the positive impact is that is being created, what is really the outcome of this. And ideally, you as the customer, you should own that impact. Right? So you should have a digital proof that this is your impact that you've created through your purchasing behavior. And if you can get all of those things right, then I do believe that there will be a significant advantage in creating impact as part of your interactions with customers. If you want to know more about the uh, diversity versus creativity and curiosity, we will get to that soon. Um, but I am still curious about some of these things. So I'm just going through those questions before uh, we get there. So uh, if you're wondering when that's going to happen, don't leave us yet. We're getting there. So, so you're talking about closing the loop and transparency. And whenever those two words come together in the last few years, the word blockchain is mentioned. Do you think it's necessary to implement a blockchain without tokens? You, you can actually do blockchains without tokens. Um, is it something that you've thought about or do you think it's not necessary or do you not know enough about it to comment? I do know something about it. I've been writing about blockchain for a few years and uh, we've built a blockchain prototype with my nonprofit in the past. I'm definitely not an expert at a technical level, but it's definitely something that we're really interested in, specifically for specific solutions that are very hard to do without a blockchain. Um, the tokenization of impact itself is not necessarily something you want to do on a blockchain um, because it's going to create quite a lot of friction, especially in terms of corporate adoption, right? So unless if you can make it really opaque so that companies don't even know it, it exists on a blockchain and they don't need to worry, worry about private keys and all of that, then yes, it can work. But what is something that's really, uh, really important in our space and that's very hard to address without a blockchain is the idea of how do we prove that the impact that 
an organization creates through its financial contributions is unique and is uniquely theirs. So if I'm, as, a, as an intermediary, if I'm selling um, a forest, let's say 100,000 trees in Indonesia to a company in the US, how is that company going to know that I'm not selling the same 100,000 trees to a company in Europe? This is a fundamental challenge in the impact space. Right? And it's not only for trees, because trees are actually quite simple because they're visible and there is some kind of accountability. But for social impact, this becomes extremely challenging. Right? So how do you know that um, it's my money that provided these five hours of education, not someone else's money? There's no tangible asset that kind of remains that you can track over time. Right? And as a consequence, solving that requires a solution that enables every organization to have complete transparency on financial flows of an organization, of an intermediary like ours, um, that enables every nonprofit, in our case, our vendors, our suppliers, to define project size in a public way, such that our corporate clients know that we haven't altered this project size on our own platform. And, and then, as these financial flows are coming in, the project size, the remaining number of impacts that can still be financed, needs to be automatically reduced until the project is fully funded. Doing this in a centralized system is possible, but it's extremely hard to build the level of trust that you could create by having a blockchain. Right? If our NGOs can create a smart contract in a very, very simple way, that enables them to say, here is a plot of land, here is a GIS file that says this is the area, these are the number of trees we're going to plant per, um, per hectare, and as finances come in to support this specific project, the remaining number of trees to be planted is going down. It becomes much easier for everyone to see on this public ledger that we are not artificially increasing or decreasing the project size to cash more money or that we are not double selling the same impact to multiple entities. And so for this specific part of our system, which we call the proof of uniqueness, a blockchain solution is absolutely the way to go. Uh, whether we're going to go there right away or in one or two years, we'll, we'll see. But we have completely conceptualized it. We've had conversations with lots of different public blockchains about building this system, but it's at the moment not the key priority. There are more urgent things to do, but it's definitely something that is in the pipeline. You mentioned things that sound very similar to what e-commerce brands have to go through, inventory management, stock management, making sure the supply chain is working so that you always have what you need, and crowdfunding as well to make sure that you don't run out of you know the the... Uh, gifts that you're going to be giving people if they're, you know, investing in you or, or whatever. So it sounds like a bunch of different systems tied together. So definitely not a simple thing to put together. Absolutely. I can understand why you're not put, trying to push that forward uh, right now. The big difference with an e-commerce is that if I'm the buyer, I know my transaction was successful the moment that I received a good, right? If the only thing you receive is a digital proof that the good, which is not a physical product then, but an actual good, a public good, uh, has been created, that level of trust that you have in your own experience is significantly lower. So we need to be held to a higher standard, hence a blockchain solution. So I want to take this opportunity to move into the next part of our conversation, because you're talking about trust and transparency some, some more. When you're trying to put together a team, and you're working in this field, how do you pitch to them the idea that we are different from other people? We actually make sure that this thing is done rather than, so, you know, how do you get people to buy into this fact that like, you're trying to be different, you're trying to change the way these things get done? How do you prove it to them? I don't think there's any real proof that is kind of 100% watertight, right? So the way we exemplify this to our corporate clients has a lot to do, I think, with building trust and reputation. My own reputation as an academic, 
my my co-founder's reputation as also a reformed academic. Uh, we've done a lot of work in this space, so we have quite a lot of knowledge. We've written about this. We worked for the UN, uh, and so I think that helps in appeasing the minds of especially people in large corporates that are not very used to working with smaller organizations that they can have faith that this is a credible organization with credible people it's equally challenging i would say to communicate those realities well i hope they are realities uh, inside our team right so because a lot of people that apply to come and work for handprint and there's heaps and heaps don't necessarily understand what we do or think they have a very rudimentary understanding but are actually incorrect in their perceptions and that has potentially a lot to do with the fact that we need to be better at communicating on our website and so what exactly it is that we do um, or we need to put out even more materials in terms of thought leadership. Like we've done like a regeneration first manifesto. We've done a recently a paper on the nature tech ecosystem that help us establish that credibility. But internally, there is also the need to continuously remind people and kind of educate people and not only our employees, also ourselves that, hey, we we work like this. And so, for instance, to give you a very simple example of this, we very recently had to do a massive sweep through our website, all of our sales materials. And so to make sure that the word fundraising does not appear in that uh, in, the, in that documentation, because it's very easy to explain to people that this is we we work a little bit like like we fundraise. Right. We are actually fundraising for these NGOs. But from a legal perspective, that's a very different beast and it exposes us to very different liabilities if we would be recognized by lawmakers here in Singapore or abroad as fundraising organizations. We are not. So we are an impact, we are an intermediary that sells impact products in the same way that an e-commerce sells whatever, physical products. But it, it requires continuous attention from the executives and from other people in the company to just make sure that these things are well communicated, that we, we have a very, very large internal FAQ that is instrumental to every new hire. They, they go through this, they read through all of these questions and they might not understand in the beginning why they're all important, but as they stay longer with the company, they'll realize, okay, that's why these things are very important. So we need to be very cautious in how we explain every little step of the equation and why we deliberately make a or why we deliberately develop a narrative that deviates from what 90 to 95 percent of our competitors are doing yeah, because most of our competitors are focusing on carbon offsetting and reducing your footprint and this is a narrative that we don't embrace so but it's the narrative that people know. So it requires continuous attention in order to make sure that especially all the uh, client facing people are very in tune with this new narrative and can speak about it expertly, which is not easy because most high quality salespeople have, don't have five or 10 years of sales experience working in an organization like ours because there aren't too many organizations like ours. So it, it takes a lot of effort, but it's, uh, yeah, I, don't know, I think it's just worth doing and obviously very important to make sure you maintain your brand identity. I think it's really interesting how you said the word competitor. I feel like any company that exists to do this kind of good isn't really a competitor because you're all working towards the same thing, assuming everyone has the same level of honesty and morality and what it is that they're doing, um, putting those two things aside, I, I guess the word competitor comes from this point of view that like, you're probably looking for investors at some point if, uh, if you haven't already raised and you know, you're trying to attract attention uh, away from someone else in order to get that attention on yourself, which is kind of a, a sad notion of, of just what capitalism is, that you have to compete with other companies when you're, you all should be working together to 
be trying to help the world, which I know everyone is, but they're doing it within their own uh, bubbles, their own little pools of existence. That word obviously has multiple connotations, right? So if you take it back to the uh, old kind of uh, Latin and Greek, uh, the origin, the epistemology of the word, uh, competare means to get fit together. Uh, and it's just been kind of bastardized into this kind of co survival of the fittest or competition to the death. I think, especially in this space, all of our competitors are competitors because they operate in the same market and try to appeal to the same types of organizations. It doesn't mean that we need to compete in a zero-sum game with them. I think the competition that exists between organizations like ours and the many other impact integration companies that have sprung up in the last couple of years um, is, is benevolent competition by and large. So far, we haven't really stooped to the lows of trying to poach key personnel from specific competitors or, or these kind of activities, which you might see more in, uh, I don't know, in the co competition between Coca-Cola and, uh, and Pepsi or between Nike and Adidas. And so I think for us, it's much more, um, I think it's a competition that is a, that, that's not zero sum, right? So where if we do better, it's probably tantamount to the reality that many of the other good ones will also do better. And if we somehow find a specific approach that really works, not necessarily going to tell all our competitors, hey, this is the way to do it, guys, this is really successful. But we are in active conversation with quite a few of our competitors between brackets in order to figure out not necessarily can we help you achieve your goals at our expense but how how do we become stronger together are there things that we are really good at that you guys are less good at and and if so can we collaborate on that front and vice versa and i think this is the way competition at least right now in this space works i want to go a little bit back into the the internal side um dealing with the employees and all of that so you had mentioned that you had an issue where some of your uh, the people that you've hired may not have been as curious as you and the executive team, uh, but you also wanted to hire a diverse team. So what were some of those original conversations with your co-founders like? For us, the real struggle has been to, to avoid the trap of homophily, maybe more than curiosity. And so homophily, I'm using that word in the kind of academic sense of the tendency of people to prefer similar people, right? Not in any kind of LGBTQ context, but as three white founders, me from Belgium, Matthias from France and Ryan from the US, um, three white male founders in our mid to late 30s, going on to 40 right now, um, I think the tendency that you have as an executive or as a founding team is early on that you're, you have to kind of figure out who do you want to bring onto the team, in, especially in the beginning, right? So the, the very first hires. And the easiest thing to do is bring people that you know are very similar to you because you know you're going to get along with them. You have a similar kind of cultural background that facilitates shared knowledge development, similar ways of working. And you probably find it easier to develop that super important sense of psychological safety and the, willing, the ability to fail uh, together and to kind of not be afraid of what you're going to be held accountable to your mistakes or something um, with people that are similar, right? But the downside of that mentality, of course, is that it creates the risk that you're not really enabling your organization to be curious in very diverse ways. Because if you have a very strong homophilic team with very similar backgrounds, let's say the first five people that we hire are also white males in their mid to late 30s uh, that have also somehow maybe moved to Asia, then you're really hiring very similar people. And the likelihood that you're going to explore in much more diverse directions as a consequence is going to be severely limited. And so that's been something that really 
um, that's been challenging, but also something we were quickly aware of that we kind of try to prevent ending up with that kind of team. But we realize that as you grow, it's, it is hard and you're bringing on people anyway that are somewhat similar, maybe from a different country. We brought on a guy from the Netherlands and a guy from Portugal and um, and then we brought on some women, but also with kind of similar backgrounds and, and many a time that didn't work out. Um, and so it's been an interesting evolution to see how our team has kind of grown from, yeah, initially three founders and then now yeah, 40 people in 12 different countries, many of whom we've never met face to face. Right. And so I think it's a continuous, um, yeah, a continuous challenge that you face as a founding team to figure out what is more important in the short run in order to achieve a specific set of goals. Is it to ensure that there is harmony and harmony often requires some form of similarity? in the team or is it to expose yourself to more diverse opinions and work with more dissimilar people which might create a reduction in kind of conversational efficiency um, but may in the long term actually be beneficial because you're you have more eyes that are looking into different directions so the first person i hired was from the philippines from my last company and I had hired him to be the uh, the lead developer and architect, right? So he was designing the backend system and documentation and all of those things. And we clashed a lot. And even after four and a half years of working together, we continued to clash a lot. And my COO, so he, he eventually became our, the CTO. The COO was a white guy from Minnesota, close friend of mine for 20 plus years. But him and I both had lived in Asia for a very long time. He still lives in Asia. He's based in Kuala Lumpur. And he's the only person that's able to help us communicate smoothly with each other. Uh, because he's in the middle as a, as a technical person who's not doing a technical position where I thought that we would get along better over time or that we'd be able to communicate better over time. But no, um, I think one of the reasons was because when I would communicate with him, I would say kind of like, this is my vision for something, but I would give him the full vision and he would assume that that's what I want right now. And he would get frustrated and, and freaked out and have anxiety about, and but you know, then and then he would complain to my COO and then my COO would be like, what are you talking about with him? And, and then I'd have to explain to him and then he'd go back and be like, no, 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 no. Like everything's good. He's talking about like the next five years, man, chill. And like, you know, obviously that's oversimplifying it, but, but essentially without him, I couldn't get the best out of the CTO. And, and that was really important because I mean, obviously as a COO, right, the, the job is to make sure that your vision is executed upon um, but if I had been able to communicate with him more smoothly, we could have gotten a lot more done a lot faster. What I was going for wasn't diversity or harmony. It was who are the best people to get the job done right now. And if those are not the right people to get the job done in the future, I'll deal with that in the future. And it kind of worked. But it also didn't. So I'm curious to hear, because you, you you said that it didn't always work or it often didn't work. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, some specific instances like I've shared and of how it didn't work out and how it did. There's been instances for us that we've, we've hired people and that we actually kind of had a early on or so something like the delivery is not just there. Right. It's just not at the level that we want. And there's a variety of explanations for this. It doesn't mean that it's the person's failure. It just might be that we're not ready to have a person with that kind of background on the team, but that we kind of kept that person on for too long. I think because of this kind of homophily kind of thing. It's like, oh, but he's so similar to us. We get along really well. Super nice person. Um, whereas in other, like, 
and I think in other instances we may have done the opposite, where we said, where we very quickly said, like, no, this isn't working, um, and we didn't give the same that person the same number of weeks or, or months to kind of get going because maybe that was also in part inspired by by homophily. But I think what's like getting back to your example also of the CTO and the CEO and, and like hiring the right person for, for right now, I think the risk with that approach is that if you don't set the culture for the organization early on, it becomes a thing that inevitably forms itself, right? It's or, an organizational culture kind of emerges in a very organic way. And if you don't have a plan or a vision of how you want the company to be and to how, it, how you want it to be perceived by employees and by external stakeholders, um, you very quickly lose control of that. So I think we probably didn't do this in the first year, but then started spending more time thinking about this. Uh, and what was very important for us, I think we, in the first year, probably, I don't know exactly when she joined, we hired a general manager, chief of staff, who has, uh, like, who's French and Vietnamese. And so I think that was very helpful for us in terms of bringing a senior woman on board who has a lot of very different talents than the founding team has, but who also has that kind of cultural ambiguity. They can manage that very well. And then I think what's been a very good fortune for us is that my co-founder, Ryan, uh, who basically works as the chief impact officer, because that's really where his passion is, but he's got a background in, in finance. And with the NGO that we also founded together, he's also developed a very strong skill in terms of product delivery. So in terms of how do you manage a product development team decentralized in different countries and so developed quite some technical expertise as well. And that, that guy is a massive empath, right? So he's an extremely empathetic person, which is an extremely rare combination of characteristics, right? Someone who is kind of a product manager with a deep knowledge of finance that is very empathetic. Like this is a very, this is, this is a unicorn uh, as an individual. You don't find many of those around. And I think um, having him on the team, on the founding team has been really helpful for, for both Matthias and I, who are both very big personalities with very big opinions and we're both loud and we're both very confident. And it's good to have someone that kind of can sit down, sit kind of fade away in the background and then tell us how we mess up uh, from a sense of not pride, but just from like, look, this is my observation. This is where you, I think you guys messed up and this is how you could communicate better. Um, I think that's been yeah, extremely helpful, definitely for me. Uh, I think also for Matthias to just have that sounding board that, you know, like uh, someone who can kind of navigate to the two biggest egos in the firm in a way that creates that harmony, even if opinions are very diverse at times. I love being that person when I'm an advisor for other companies, but my COO is that person for me in everything else that I do. Um, and, and to be fair, when we were talking about the CTO and all that, don't get me wrong, he is phenomenal. Like we would not have technology without this guy. And I wouldn't have wanted anyone else to do that for the company. It's just that him and I had a personality clash. And so I tried to temper that by communicating with him less and allowing my COO to do more of the communication. I think that's really wise. Right? So at some point, even if you're the CEO or if you're, I mean, if you're one of the founders, there's obviously expectations on you to be present, but it's important that you take yourself out of the equation when there are company decisions to be made or um, when there are specific interactions to be had where you know this is not a place where I excel. And so for me personally, it's become very obvious that I'm not very good at hiring people or necessarily firing people, but I'm not very good at that decision-making based on very 
un incomplete and rudimentary information about someone. And as a consequence, I've said like, look, just take me out of this. Like, I don't want to be involved in hiring. Like, I will be involved like when everyone agrees that this is a good person and then they still need to meet with another founder. And I just have to assess kind of cultural fit and whether or not I would, would like to work with this person, then I'll happily be involved. But don't involve me at any of the other stages because I'm just not good at making this the decision, is this person going to go through to the next round, yes or no. I think, yeah, that's also something you learn as in, yeah, when you're in a team, you just think, look, these are not my, uh, this is not my strong suit. So just don't keep me involved in this in the same way with like, oh, if I have to do uh, 360 reviews of people, like I can do it directly, but it's going to be very direct. <laughs> and as a consequence, it's better to have a buffer that said, like, okay, I'm going to shout or share my opinions about something and then communicate this with somebody else who can package them better and then communicate those in a way that they are more likely to be understood. In the very beginning, I was uh, running the hiring process, the, the whole hiring process. And then my when I hired my COO, he was like, yeah, your hiring process is crap. We need to redo it. <laughs> so then he took me out of it mostly. And then I felt like the people we were hiring after that weren't the most like excited and it wasn't his fault. It was the fact that I wasn't there to share who we are and why we are. And so I, I insisted on reinserting myself into the hiring process where I wasn't there to decide the final decision. I was there in the very beginning. I was the first person that everyone met so that I could disseminate culture in a 30 minute period where I could assess their potential for culture fit and their excitability. And if based on their CV, they have experience doing what we need them to do and you know they fit this culture and they can you know, basically, I asked them a few questions. What, you know, something like, uh, why are you leaving your job? When are you going to be able to come over to us? How much are you looking for? Like these kinds of basic things to see, do they fit our needs? But then also to spend time sharing why we started the company and, and all that. And if they pass those things, I would hand them off to the next person, which would be the their hiring manager. Who's going to be managing them directly? They have to run the hardware, or not the hardware test, the the hard skills test, right? So we we developed a process where they meet multiple people along the way over like three or four meetings, but I'm the one that says this person has the potential to be a cultural fit or not. So some people will say, oh, like you said, oh, I only want to know if like they're they pass everybody else. But I wanted to make sure that they passed me before they could pass everybody else. Because if they pass everybody else and then they fail me, I've wasted the team's time. I would rather waste a little bit of my time first and not the team's time because I think their time is more valuable than mine. It's super interesting, right? So I was just telling you before about, I think that we took us a year before we really started to define our culture and then uh, like how we wanted to, what we wanted the organization to be perceived as and but it's true that if you explain this to me in the way you do, then in our hiring process, we don't put culture first. And, and maybe this is just a mistake that we're still making. It's very possible. Um, and of course, there is time constraints. And as you, as you well know, as an entrepreneur, that you never have enough time in a day. And so um, maybe we feel that it's uh, more valuable to get through, I don't know, the, the hiring manager and the chief of staff and before so one of the founders need to spend time with that person. But I guess you're right that if you really want to put culture first, then the first interview they should have is with someone that evangelizes that culture and evangelizes the company and, and why we do what we do and then makes a decision. Um, to a certain extent, I think we have a lot of online content available, especially my face and, uh, and voice appears in lots of videos. And so, so people can have a, a taste of what it is, but it's obviously not the same as a one-on-one -on -one sitting together with uh, one of the founders. But I do think that the downside of your approach is that it becomes very hard to scale if you're 
really growing fast. And of course, that's not yet the case for us. But I feel that we are trying to put processes in place that will still work when we're 500 people rather than when we're, as we are now, 40. I think that's your mistake because you have to assume that whatever you're building right now at 40 will break by 150. So whatever process you have now, it won't exist. It, it just, it can't. It will break multiple times over, probably 10 times over before you hit 500. And, you know, sure, you're at 40. Um, I can understand how you think it might be difficult at that point to be able to do that. But for uh, the way I see the CEO's job, I see there's a few things the CEO has to do. One is disseminate culture. Two is disseminate vision. Three is make sure that the best people are there. And four is make sure there's enough money so that you can feed those people. Right? And so if a quarter of my time is spent interviewing people, then that's one of the four things. That's my responsibility. You know? I, I definitely understand at some point that will break too. Maybe at 100. Maybe, maybe when you're hiring the 100th person, it's no longer possible to spend your time doing that. But if you end up with 500 people for which you know the names and faces of the first 100 and you've disseminated the culture to them, hopefully you did a good enough job that they can do the rest and continue disseminating the culture to the rest of the team that, that gets hired. But, um, you know, e even when I only had, you know, at the, at the most number of, of people on the team, we had 17. And when I would arrange a one-on-one -on -one call with any of the team members, they were, uh, to my like s delightful surprise, they were shocked that I would come and spend an hour with them. Like I would do uh, like once every two or three months, I would get on the phone with them. I would ask them how they're doing, what's their life like, what's their family like. You know, I wasn't doing a performance review. I just wanted to get to the the human side. You know, how are you? You know, are are, am I doing my job as a CEO? Are you enjoying your position? Is there something that you want from your career that you're not getting that we can help you to get, right? What can we do? And again, at 15, at 20, it's a lot easier to do than, than at 40 or 100, whatever. But I felt like that was a part of my job. And it's something that I love to do, is to communicate. And and like what I found funny was when I would ask them these personal questions, they'd be like, well, you know, uh, if, if I said, oh, how are you doing? Well, you know, the job is this and this. We've been working on this. Nah, I don't care about that. I just want to know how are you doing. Like any of that stuff, you talk about that with your manager, right? I'm, I'm not concerned about your performance. I'm concerned about what's in here. And they were like blown away by the fact that I was taking the time. You know, let's say it's 15 hours every three months, right? Some people go, oh, 15 hours. That's so much time. You know, you could be doing something better. For me, that's the best use of my time, at least at that size. You're probably correct. Um, again, I'm not the CEO, so uh, maybe that's my excuse. <laughs> but I also genuinely think I wouldn't be very good at that. And so um, there are, yeah, there are specific kind of soft skills that are not necessarily within my uh, my arsenal of, uh, of of strengths. And so having these kind of informal conversations, especially if they need to happen via a computer, right? So if you can do this face to face, like this happens, of course, with the people in Singapore or when I go to Bali and I see the team there, then we go for drinks and we, we have a, a random chat. Um, but it's harder to do with, um, let's say some of our team in India that are developers, uh, except for one, uh, they're all developers. And I'm, I may be wrong, but I'm, I'm not sure to what extent that they would think this is a good way for them to spend an hour of their time. I think they would just feel like, well, I have to spend an hour of my time. That just means I need to spend an hour extra working later in order to kind of compensate for the fact that I haven't been doing uh, my tasks and so. And, and maybe I'm completely wrong about this. Um, but I think that there are... The, the risk in this kind of approach is that... Um, it's like this idea that it comes from the Bible, right? So you should treat people the way you want to be treated. That's like a biblical narrative. Bullshit. 
because that assumes that people are the same as you. You should treat people the way they want to be treated. And that may be very, very different. I think so. And it's really important that I think the risk of saying like, oh, I think it's a good idea to have this kind of informal chat with lots of my employees. And I personally, I agree. I think it's a good idea. But imposing that or, or doing that may also mean that you're kind of imposing a specific cultural approach to employee relationships that might really clash with their perception of what is appropriate and might make them feel very uncomfortable. Um, and so, and maybe that's just an excuse that I'm using now. It's possible. But I do kind of worry about this notion that, like, I would like that. Like, I remember when I had uh, my mentor back at university, we, he, looked, he took a lot of time to have these kind of social interactions with me. And I thought that was really, really useful and productive. But it doesn't mean that everyone likes that. Because if I look at, again, I go back to the university context where I've been longer than an entrepreneur. Um, if I look at many of my Asian colleagues, they would never do this. And, if they would, and I think they, they would find it very, very strange to try to kind of personalize this, this relationship in a way. And that's exactly why I found they like it. So, for example, one of the um, one of the guys was from Pakistan, and when I had the conversation with him, he was like, "I've never even like spoken to the CEOs of my past companies. Like, I didn't even know their names or faces. I knew nothing about them. I was just a guy doing a job." And so, it's like awesome that you would be willing to spend the time to talk to me and get to know me. Right. So I think and and other ones from the Philippines, they would say something similar, like I'm not used to having a relationship with, you know, the person above my boss. I'm not used to being asked how I feel about anything like these things aren't part of our culture to do. And I think it's that that difference in how an American or specifically myself approaches it is is interesting to them because they've never experienced it. And so they like it, they enjoy it. I, I think they see it like that. At least they, that's how they've expressed it to me. I mean, the way that we are doing this internally much more is that there's a lot of meetings, like team meetings that are, obviously they're mostly work focused, although we have kind of social hours where everyone can drop in and just have a random chat. And so I think we do this more at a group level. Um, within the different teams, like in the product team, the growth team, the sales team, the strategy, the uh, HR, the marketing, like, so we have, all, and there's a lot of overlaps in those teams as well, because we're still quite small. So there are these moments where you have much more kind of spontaneous conversations. And, but I, I find personally that, of course, with bigger groups, there's always more room for silence for people, but I find it most effective when these types of conversations are not instigated by the leaders in the organization. Um, so we have a few, let's say, I mean, we don't have that structure, but I'd say like middle managers, like early hires um, that are very good at this. And I think because they work on a more day-to-day -day basis with uh, specific people, it's much easier for them to say like, oh, by the way, yesterday I watched this movie, have you seen it? And have that kind of little social engagement, even though everyone's there. because. Um, Maybe it's just also my own kind of perception of hierarchy that um, I feel like if, if I'm asking this question that people are not necessarily going to communicate as honestly um, or maybe just not communicate at all, um, which may also be a cultural thing either on their side or on my side that I, uh, that I just have this erroneous expectation. I don't know. But I can, we'll try it. As an American, we thrive on honesty we almost demand it uh, where a lot of asians feel uncomfortable about being asked their opinions by their superiors because it's generally not something that happens so what i did from the very beginning was i made it very clear to them if i mess up tell me to my face immediately you will not be fired because if I mess up, I need to know. It's an opportunity for me to get better. And sometimes I don't see that I mess up. And so the only way I know is if you tell me, right? So 
and and then there were instances where, let's say, for example, my CTO would say something to my face in front of other people about how I messed up. And honestly, you know, it was a little difficult to process because it looked like to the other people he was being disrespectful because he's Asian and I'm not and they're Asian, right? So for them, it's super disrespectful for that to happen. And I took it, right? There were times where I made a bad decision and I owned up to it in front of everybody. I apologized, I explained, right? Um, and I think it's those examples of vulnerability that give people the courage to be honest with you. We've in instigated this practice. We've only done it, I think, twice, but it's normally gonna be like every two months that we hold a, a company-wide session about my biggest F-up. And, um, and so, yeah, Matthias has done it, our CEO, I have done it. I think the next one is going to be Ryan, um, so the three founders first, where we, yeah, basically talk about this is something we did, a decision we made in the company that turned out really badly or that clearly was a mistake and talk about it openly and trying to kind of instigate that uh, that conversation and also that culture right so that failure is okay um, and that we that we're not going to punish people for trying and failing right so we recently had this uh, um, urgent kind of very last minute uh, project delivery that we need to do for a client and it we got it done 24 hours late which by and large was a massive success because the deadline was pretty much impossible. But then what I realized, because still the client was expecting it a day early, created some friction that then I, as I was a project manager needed to handle, but in the end, all, all good. But culturally, it was interesting to, to, to see that from my perspective, there was a need to do a post-mortem to get everyone together, to kind of get the different opinions, learn it's like, how come we couldn't do this? Like we tried to do it. Yes, you guys had to work over the weekend already. It was uh, challenging, but the deadline was there. And in the morning that we were supposed to deliver it, like nothing worked. It was completely a disaster. And then we had another 16 hours of super hard work to get it functioning, which it did, which is great. Um, but so we need to talk about this. And there were other people in the team that were like, well, all is good and ends well. Which is interesting. It's like, well, yeah, it's good. We, we got it done, but we didn't get it done on time and we didn't get it done in the way we were supposed to get it done. So we need to figure out where we made mistakes. And, and so I think that that learning culture and that willingness to own up to mistakes is still something that uh, it takes a lot of time to develop uh, in an organization, especially a multicultural organization that's decentralized, where you have people in very different backgrounds, very different countries um, that are pretty much only communicating through Zoom and Telegram and um, and workplace and, and these kind of calls, um, but that never really have the opportunity to sit together and kind of have a drink or uh, do a kind of a social event together. So there's still, I think, a lot of, uh, there, there's just cultural differences that you're never really going to iron out, but that as the as leaders in the organization, you have to say, well, no, we need to have a conversation about this because, yes, it's good that we managed to deliver, but still stuff went wrong. We need to figure out what went wrong. And this is not about firing people. This is not about assigning blame. This is about learning where processes broke down, where communication broke down, where messages weren't very clearly conveyed and how we can do this better in the next time so that the next time we have to do a sprint like this, we are not going to have the same issues. And that's where curiosity comes in, because if you're not curious, then you won't think to ask those questions and you may not make those, you may not learn and you may not improve. Yeah, totally agree. It's, it's curiosity, but also, yeah, I think the audacity to take ownership and maybe the um, kind of perfectionism, right? So you need to, uh, you need to want to recognize where things went wrong. And that's the only way you can really make progress. So, yeah, and that's, uh, yeah, as the team grows, uh, there's always going to be issues like that, that we need to 
fix and try to get more people to see it the same way. But uh, it's not going to be an easy, easy thing. So is there anything we haven't talked about that you'd like to add? I mean, nobody has a blue plate or, or a blueprint of uh, what makes your company successful. I think a lot of it is still gut feeling and getting advice from the right people. That's maybe one thing we haven't really touched on. I think that we've been extremely lucky with um, a lot of friends and family and business angels that have invested early on that continuously work with us on specific aspect of the business, um, which has proven to be very, very useful in many different areas. So that would be maybe the one other thing to, yeah, to remember that it's not only the employees and the comp and the, the clients. Like a lot of the the best advice comes from the network of people that you build um, as an organization and just as friends. And yeah, we've definitely benefited from that a lot. Thank you very much for that, Simon. I appreciate it. Don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And as we begin our journey through 2023, don't forget as well that the world is ever changing, evolving around you. And the most important thing moving forward is how we build our company, how we uh, build our corporate culture, how we handle our teams, but also how we create positive impact with the money that we generate from the products and the services that we make available to our customers. If, if you're interested in learning more about Simon's business, you should check it out at, I believe it's handprint.tech. I'll have the link in the uh, description. So thank you again, Simon.